Hello, welcome to this week's edition of Daily Coast is the Brief with me, your host, Daily Coast founder, Marcos Molitzis. It's a real pleasure to have you here to talk about the news and just as importantly, what you can do about them. This week's guest is Daily Coast senior political writer, Joan McCarter. But for now, let's start with some headlines. So first one, another poll says Dems want VP Elizabeth Warren as Biden Warren team up on an opt-in. This is by me. And um, there's been some tea leaves in the last few weeks that point to Warren being, if not Joe Biden's uh, future VP pick, at least a front runner for that position. Uh, for example, he teamed up with Elizabeth Warren to write an opinion piece in newspapers attacking Donald Trump's coronavirus response. He has also uh, been very, very complimentary towards Warren adopting key tenets of her plan. But outside of that, there's a lot of pressure also to pick a black female VP uh, nominee and South Carolina representative Jim Clyburn. Jim Clyburn was one of those people. And just the last couple of days, he has actually backed off on that and said that it would be okay or it would be preferable for him to have a black vice president, but it wasn't necessary. And Barack Obama actually went to Twitter and Barack Obama does nothing without uh, fully planning, without fully considering how those words affect things. He's no Donald Trump for sure. Uh, Barack Obama went to Twitter to talk about how amazing Elizabeth Warren's coronavirus response plan was. And keep in mind, Joe Biden also has a coronavirus response plan. <laughs> so uh, if I was uh, Biden, I might have been a little bit ticked off by that. But maybe if we want to read tea leaves, maybe that means something. Also, the person in charge of the uh, in charge of Joe Biden's transition team that is in planning what the administration is going to look like is a guy named, named Ted Kaufman. Kaufman was Biden's chief of staff when he was in the Senate. He also replaced Biden in the Senate for two years when Biden went to be vice president. Kaufman is incredibly anti-Wall Street. His politics align with Elizabeth Warren. And he has talked in the past, including in 2016, about Joe Biden teaming up with Warren on a presidential ticket. So that's great. Uh, those are tea leaves. Of course, they are tea leaves. <laughs> they have, they're great for tea. I'm not sure they're predictive of anything. But two polls last week had shown, not last week, this week, have shown that a majority of Democratic voters want Biden to pick Elizabeth Warren. Uh, a CBS poll this earlier this week again, said that 71% of Democrats said that Joe Biden should consider Elizabeth Warren, and that number was 72% amongst Black Democrats. So while some people talk about how Biden must pick a Black vice presidential nominee, uh, Black voters aren't as dead set, as a majority, aren't as dead set on that, uh, according at least to these two polls. Now, I've been saying that Stacey Abrams, who used to run the House Democratic Caucus in the state of Georgia uh, and ran for governor and almost won two years ago, I'm I've been saying that she might be the best sort of consensus safe pick. Um, some people have complained that she has been campaigning too hard for the job, which I think is maybe the dumbest complaint ever. She should campaign for the job. She'd be great vice president. Um, but she is perhaps lacking on the experience angle, maybe. I don't buy it, but that's one of the arguments against her. But it's clear that the, the majority of the Democratic electorate would love to see Elizabeth Warren as the VP, and she would automatically unite the ticket. And one of the problems that Hillary Clinton had in 2016 is that she had a divided party heading into the convention heading into election season, and Elizabeth Warren would solve that. In fact, a poll of our revolution members back a couple days ago, and our revolution is the offshoot of the 2016 Bernie Sanders campaign, a poll of our revolution members, 61% wanted Elizabeth Warren, I think about 20% wanted 
uh, Stacey Abrams. Really, those are the only two candidates that Joe Biden should be considering for VP. Next headline. This is by Joan McCarter, who will be joining me here in a few minutes. And the headline is, Americans who aren't Republicans still don't want to share space with each other at all. So, quote, a new Washington Post University of Maryland poll shows that the majority of people clearly oppose the reopening of restaurants, retail stores, and other business businesses, even as governors begin to lift restrictions that have kept the economy locked down in an effort to combat the coronavirus pandemic. The Post finds that Americans in states with loser restrictions report similar levels of discomfort as those in states with stricter rules. Quote, there's a partisan gap in this poll with Republicans and lean Republicans being significantly more willing to be out infecting people. We're seeing this in our own civics polling, that's civics with a Q, uh, where Republicans think that what this is a hoax, people are out to get Donald Trump, uh, Republican dirty trickster James O'Keefe, I think, uh, yesterday was talking about how those dead people were all made up in crisis actors. And so Republicans think that this is no big deal, while Democrats and independents are actually scared of dying because this virus is actually killing people by the tens of thousands. Right now, it's about 2,000 a day in the United States. Uh, Republicans apparently don't care. And, uh, and by doing that, by, by advocating for loser restrictions, they are putting everybody at risk. If it was only them, maybe I'd be okay with it, but they're putting first responders at risk, they're putting medical personnel at risk, and they're putting neighbors and family and other people that may be doing the right thing at risk by behaving so irresponsibly. And you know what? Republicans think that by loosening restrictions, they can reopen the economy back up sooner, thus mitigating the, the job losses that are going to be a drag for Donald Trump and the Republicans in this November's elections. But the fact is, as this poll shows that Joe McCarter wrote about, that as long as people are afraid of dying, they're not gonna be going to movie theaters. They're not gonna be going to get haircuts or, uh, or getting their nails done. And if they don't do that, the economy is just not going to rebound. They're not, this, this economy is not going anywhere until people feel safe enough to go out. And, the last thing I want to talk about is Senator Marsha Blackburn. She's a Tennessee Republican, and she tweeted, I introduced the Stop COVID Act to give all Americans the ability to sue China in U.S. courts for the damage they've inflicted on our country. This is the same Republican Party that is refusing to allow any aid to states or individuals unless businesses are granted blanket legal immunity from lawsuits from employees that have been put at risk by their employers uh, due to the coronavirus pandemic. So in other words, if you force your employees to come to work too soon, or if you force them to come to work when they're still sick, as we found out happened in two Utah businesses earlier this week, uh, Republicans want to make sure that those employees can't sue their employers for putting them at risk. Yet here they are wanting to sue China to the damage that Donald Trump has inflicted in our country. And, and also, can we talk about the absurdity of calling it the Stop COVID Act as though this virus is gonna look at this legal threat to China and go, <laughs> we're done, we're out of this country. This is just too scary for us. We're gonna be out of here. So of course, it doesn't stop COVID. Of course, it does nothing to alleviate the suffering of the American people, whether it's deaths, or whether it's economic damage. And it's just posturing and an attempt by Republicans to shift the blame to China from their own, uh, from their own gross negligence in dealing with this pandemic. And it's telling that here we are, 75,000 dead, and Republicans are still trying to defend Donald Trump and his utter inability to deal with this. Unbelievable. So anyway, without further ado, my guest today is Joan 
but McCarter. She is a Daily Coast senior political writer, and in fact, the most senior of all Daily Coast staff writers, the first one ever hired at Daily Coast 13 years ago. Daily Coast is 2000, 18 years. So she was the first person I was able to hire to write. She sold with us 13 years later. She's an expert on legislative matters, an expert on healthcare policy, and an expert on Maine's embattled Republican Senator Susan Collins. And that's what we want to talk about today. So Joan, thank you for joining me. I am thrilled to be here, Mark. 13 years. And you know me so well, 13 years. It's it's mind blowing. <laughs> and you know, thank you. Susan thank you. Collins, you know so much about so many things, but Susan Collins <laughs> is that one topic that really gets your goat up, isn't it? It is. It is. And it has for a really, really, really long time. Not the entire 13 years, but a good chunk of them. Yeah. You know me too well, Marcos. <laughs> So last week I had David Neron, he's our political director. We talked about the Senate picture and, and I asked him what race would he most want to win? And he said the Montana Senate race because we don't have a lot of chances to win a Senate seat in Montana. And he was absolutely right on the merits. But when he asked me the same question, I said Maine because right here in, in, in my heart, in my gut, I want nothing more than for Susan Collins to go down. And so she is a survivor though, right? She's She's been in the Senate for 23 years yep. as a Republican in a blue yep. state. How has she managed that? Um, by pretending to be a moderate, by fooling a lot of people for way too long. Um, for example, human rights campaign. And for example, Planned Parenthood and NARAL and Feminist Majority, all of these groups that needed a moderate Republican woman um, to sort of shore up their base, to say, look, we can work with everybody in Congress. And here's Susan Collins here. She'll do that for us, except, of course, she wasn't doing that for us. And um, finally, I think that her, her Teflon has a few chinks in it. Um, one of the problems that you've really never heard about before with Susan Collins is that in her entire Senate career, she hasn't held a town meeting and she's still not holding them. And she got away with it before. She's not anymore. She's not anymore. People are really upset that they can't get her to answer their questions in person. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see how quickly and how drastically public opinion about her has shifted. Now, she, she has been years. quite um, a moderate hurting. on legislative issues, right? I mean, didn't she vote for Barack Obama's Affordable Care Act? No, she didn't. That she voted... In 2009, when it came to the Senate, in December of 2009, she voted against it. Is she a moderate on taxes? Uh, did she vote against Donald Trump's giveaway to the billionaires? No, she did not. And if you remember that, Susan Collins traded her vote on that with Mitch McConnell with his promise that if she voted for it and it included a repeal of the individual mandate of the Affordable Care Act. So all of a sudden she's supporting the Affordable Care Act. What I mean, if go ahead. He promised her she could have health care bills come up on the floor if she voted for the tax bill, then she would do it. And of course, she believed Mitch McConnell. You promised her she could have her vote. So yeah, tax cuts for millionaires, no health insurance for anybody else. She's fully on board. She, she's gotten all those endorsements from, like you said, a human rights campaign and NARA and so and so. So at least she's been good on judges, correct? I mean, the kind of judges that are ruling on these critical <laughs> issues that affect those groups, right? She is not voting <laughs> right on judges on that issue. Um, you might remember, and this is the thing that was really the turning point for her with Maine voters, that she voted for Brett Kavanaugh. And she did so after refusing to meet with any Maine groups who wanted to talk to her about this vote. Um, she refused to talk to Maine women. She talked to Brett Kavanaugh. She said, well, he told me he believes Roe v. Wade is the law of the land. So that's good enough for me. 
She, she loves to talk about how much she believes people given their promises. Uh. <laughs> and then when they break their promises, how very concerned she is that they have done so. And she'll be keeping an eye on that in the future. Oh, I, I, so what exactly makes her a moderate at this point? Yeah, nothing that I can put my finger on. I mean, she's taking money from gun groups. She's taking money from NRA supporters. She's she's taking money from a lot of people who are not in Maine. In fact, she has huge corporate and PAC donations. Does um, she very ever few. vote against Republicans when it matters? Uh, she did once. She did once on the skinny Trump care plan. She <laughs> and Lisa Murkowski and John McCain. Her one vote. Um, and, you know, she had pretty much already traded it. They, they didn't know McCain was going to say no. So McConnell let her vote on that one and, and rude the day. Um, most, mostly when Susan Collins goes up against Republicans, goes up against Trump or up against McConnell, it's because they figured out that they don't need her vote. McConnell's allowing her to oppose him. So polling clearly shows that Collins is now amongst the most unpopular senators in the country. And at least the polling I've seen, she's behind the, the uh, presumptive Democratic nominee, uh, Sarah Gideon. Right. Uh, can you talk about a little bit what changed? Because she was amongst the most popular. Uh, and I guess some of the answer is Kavanaugh, but is it really Kavanaugh? Part of it's Kavanaugh. Part of it is that she has had to embrace Trump. As you know, the main Republicans went as crazy as the rest of Republicans in the country did. And in order to fight off a potential challenge from the right, she had to move right. I mean, we, we talked about Paul LePage maybe jumping into the Senate race after he was kicked out as governor. Um, so she really did have to show her true colors and be a real Republican, a crazy Republican. And that, it opened up a lot of people's eyes to what Susan Collins is, which is essentially <laughs> two-faced. She says all of these great things about being a moderate and when it comes to the vote, she doesn't do it. So is, the, is there still a filing deadline or are we are we set We're past, on... we're past. That oh, was end past. of March. We, she for sure is running for a reelection. Yep, she's definitely running for re-election. She's definitely checking checking all the boxes with her people at home and getting all of those big, big money donations from the PACs. Um, so what she is, what is, however, trying to get back on the moderate fence just a little bit by refusing to say if she voted for Donald <laughs> Trump in the primary. <laughs> I know, can you believe that? <laughs> Boy, that'll, that'll be worth uh, something. Uh, no, it's funny when right. people do that. I remember a Democratic candidate in Kentucky uh, refusing to say whether she voted for Obama, right? So when you do that, Republicans don't believe you, so you get no points from yeah. them. And then the Democrats got angry at her, and here it's vice versa, right? I'm not sure who she thinks she That's a really to. good point about Collins. Republicans don't trust her either, really. The hardcore Trumpy Republicans don't trust her. So, you know, that's part of where her support has been gone. But that that she hasn't had that for a long time. It really is the, there are still moderate Republican women in Maine. It's them and it's the Democratic women who would vote for her because she was there and she wasn't as bad as she could have been um, previously. And we're not there anymore. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about the Democratic challenger? Um, the most likely challenger is going to be Sarah Gideon. They were supposed to have the primary next month on June 9th, I believe. It's now going to be July 14th, delayed because of coronavirus. Sarah Gideon has the bulk of the money, the bulk of the support. She is the um, current House Speaker of Maine in the legislature, um, staunchly pro-choice. She's done a lot of work advocating for women. She's done a lot of work advocating for the the folks in Maine who were uninsured, for example, she um, stood up to Paul Lepage on Medicaid expansion on a number of issues. So she has experience dealing with somebody like Donald Trump. <laughs> the first Donald Trump was Paul Lepage, as he liked to say, um, and with the Mitch McConnell types. So I, you know, I think she could come to the Senate 
pretty well prepared to deal with the Republicans. All right. So we know that a Democratic Senate majority runs through Maine. This is a quick recap. We need to pick up three seats in the White House to have a 50 seat majority plus the tiebreaker vice president. Uh, we're probably going to lose the Alabama seat. So the top three chances or opportunities are, are Arizona, Colorado, uh, North Carolina, it turns out it's one of mm -hmm. those three, mm -hmm. but Maine as well. So what can we do, uh, listeners and viewers, what can we all do to hasten the defeat of Susan Collins and by extension, Mitch McConnell? We can keep donating at our Act of Blue page, and I believe we're going to have the link available to that. We are. Right now it's to the Senate loan fund because the primary hasn't been completed in Maine, but as soon as it is, all of the money that we're holding in escrow will go to the to the nominee, which we presume is going to be Sarah Gideon. And, and this is right. we talked about the nominee fund last week, but we started doing those in 2018 and they are fantastic mm -hmm. because you have these Democrats who can't raise general election money because they're busy in a primary. They win the primary and boom, suddenly they have hundreds of thousands or even millions. And I think the nominee fund for our Democratic uh, nominee in, in Maine, I think it's over six million, right? Yeah, it's huge because we started immediately after the Kavanaugh hearings. Yeah. And, yeah. and to be clear, it wasn't just Daily Coast raising no. into that nominee fund, right? But right. collectively as a grassroots, I think Gideon's over six million or whoever the nominee is going to be Gideon, over six million overnight and um she'll need more yeah yeah <laughs> more the better this, i just want to say this is not to downplay who betsy sweet is who is the other um real contender not not likely to win because gideon has most of the political backing but betsy sweet has been a phenomenal activist and organizer in maine for for decades um particularly for women for women and for for people of color and for the poor. So Betsy Sweet, we really, she would be fantastic as well. It's more likely to end up being Sarah Gideon. Joan, thank you so very much. And thank you for 13 amazing years. And actually yeah. years before you came on as a, as a, and an employee even. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's been a long wild ride and, and uh, your expertise is a critical component of Daily Coast's coverage of the news. And I'm so happy to have you here and at Daily Coast. So uh, thank you, Marcos. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us this week. There will be links in the show notes below on how you can donate to the Maine Democratic uh, Senate nominee fund, uh, probably Sarah Gideon. This is definitely a winnable race and a critical race if we want to take control of the Senate. Thank you again very much. Have a great week. Talk to you next one. Bye-bye.